Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 35, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And we're into our first episode of September. Yes, it's September and it's starting to get wintry, isn't it? It is, yeah. I think it's like we're recording this about nine o'clock at night. It's literally pitch black outside now. Totally. It does mean though it's an exciting time of year because, you know, the weather gets a bit colder. People might sit inside and, you know, maybe watch Facebook videos on a weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe have a little chill on a Sunday. And uh, I was DJing on a Sunday on the Retro Hour page and I'm absolutely blown away with the reaction. It's crazy. I'm a rubbish DJ, so shouldn't be that many people watching, but... um. We've reached 19k people with that. 19,000 people. Now, you're putting yourself down there, Ravi. I think you did very well on this. Bearing in mind, you were DJing with 20-year-old computers. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. Well, <laughs> it, it, if I put myself down now, I can improve next Sunday. So I'm going to keep this going, seeing it's had such a big reaction. So join me at 1pm on a Sunday, and we'll get Dan in there, and we'll we'll play some games later on, and, you know, we're... We can expand this Sunday thing. Yeah. It's good little fun idea, isn't it? Well, we it? thought that, you know, obviously you did the little DJ set, which was um, was about 90 minutes you did in the end, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, like one hour 33. Yeah. yeah, Amiga Mod Music you were doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, like you said, you know, 19,000 people shoot did to watch that, which is just <laughs> insane. So we're definitely going to do more of this kind of thing. Like Ravi said, you know, we might do like a, you know, night in a weekend where we have a couple of drinks and play a few like video yeah, games or good. whatever. it's so. good just to have a live chat room in there. And, you know, um, I, I was said that I'm going to do Jungle and Drum and Bass, uh, I'm not, because that's going to give everyone a headache on a Sunday. <laughs> so I think I'll, I'll stick with a bit of mods, yeah. uh, but, but some different ones this week. Some ambient mods. <laughs> ambient mods, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's you know, it's basically you're getting us, you know, an extra hour and a half of Ravi or me or maybe both of us during the week. So yeah, yeah. definitely jump onto our Facebook page and give it a like if you haven't already. Just search for the Retro Hour podcast and uh, keep an eye out for those live broadcasts. You actually get a little pop-up on your phone. I saw I was on the M1 at the time when you went live. <laughs> so I watched Flash down the motorway. Well, yeah. I, I watched that one again at home, I thought. Yeah. yeah, but nice work. That was some banging mods you played in there as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, I can't wait to see your set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might need a bit of practice on them first. Yeah. And I also want to say a massive, massive thank you this week to Andy McRae and Martin Rothwell, who they're both made very generous donations to the Retro Hour during yeah, the week. Thanks so much, guys. Really um, helps with abs- the cost. Absolutely yeah. does. I think we've just about reached the cost where we can cover our SoundCloud subscription now. So Yeah, ace. So we have got a donation button on the front page of the website. Anything you do give, of course, as we've said before, it uh, goes into the running of the show. But, you know, obviously don't feel obligated. Entirely up to you. But, you know, this show we bring you quality guests. And the guest this week is amazing quality, isn't he, Dan? This guy is behind one of my all-time favourite adventure games. Now, we are talking about Steve Ince. He used to work for Revolution back in the day. Now, Beneath a Steel Sky, what a game. Beneath the Steel Sky was like just the music and the atmosphere and the drawings. It was amazing for me. It was like a comedy as well, you know. And yeah. Broken Sword, he moved on to later to Witcher as well. Yeah. And, you know, loads of really massive... Europe, Europe's biggest adventure game title, Broken Sword, was. So um, he's going to come on and talk about, you know, developing like Beneath the Steel Sky and uh, Broken Sword and all those classic adventure games. And also um, we'll find out a bit about the uh, the new project he's working on, which sounds really, really cool as well. Yeah, and possibly the future of adventure games. Absolutely. So this is definitely one for the adventure heads. Steve Ince, formerly of Revolution, on the Retro Hour in about half an hour from now. Now let's get into this week's stories, um, starting quite appropriately with... A point-and-click adventure story. Yeah, this was submitted by a listener, James Lightfoot, and he um, was doing a Kickstarter project. He actually submitted it when the Kickstarter was ongoing. I was supposed to talk about it, but now it's been funded <laughs> and successful. so we can. He doesn't it. need us. <laughs> no, no he's, he's good on his own. Now, this game's called The, uh, the Mystery of Woolly Mountain. Yeah, and it, it looks really good. There's, like, different elements in it. You know, the art's really nicely done, and there's elements like... You can play old arcade games in there, Arknoid, and, you know, there's deep sea exploration and many other things that you don't usually see in a point and click. I love the um, the characters in the game as well. It, <laughs> it's five time-travelling scientists known collectively as the Helmholtz Resonators, <laughs> and uh, they also uh, play instruments. One of them plays bass, one guitar, <laughs> keyboard, drums, and they conduct science while moving through time. Ah, oh, science, time-travelling <laughs> band. That's what you need. Exactly, so... It's probably fair to say you've never played a game quite like this before. No. Um, but there is a free demo that you can download off their website. And uh, the game's due out very soon, actually, October this year. So uh, it looks awesome. I think it's, you know, obviously we're going to talk more about adventure games in a bit. But obviously we heard about, you know, the, the new Ron Gilbert game, Thimbleweed Park. Yep. That's coming out. So I think, you know, it's kind of had a bit of a, um, a comeback recently, hasn't it? This kind of point-and-click adventure. Yeah, yeah. Genre. And and it's a comeback by 
amazing people that are, you know, really high end in the game of adventures and point and click stuff. It's it's not like a few years ago there was an adventure game comeback and there was a really bad title. Oh yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um this does look really, really polished as well. Like you said, it's actually made the the goal on Kickstarter, but um you can order it off their website and we'll pop a link in the show notes at the retrohour.com. Now speaking of our website, last week we asked a, a rather interesting question based on the Amiga Vampire FPGA accelerators. Now, we had Gunnar, who's um, one of the team, and if you missed last week's show, we're talking about, um, at the moment, there's an accelerator that's come out for the Amiga 600. Mm -hmm. And this basically makes your Amiga 600 like 150 times faster than it originally was. I'm holding mine in my hand. <laughs> it's just arrived. I'm going to go home and install it later. Ravi got his today. Is yeah. that left your side all day? Is that in your pocket no, all day? Yeah, yeah. I've been holding <laughs> on to it, made sure I don't lose it. But if you're not familiar with this project, it also gives you stuff like, you know, 24-bit graphics, and there's going to be like, you know, a 16-bit sound core on there soon SD as well. SD card on there as well. You HDMI know? outs on yeah. it as well. Now, they started on the Amiga 600, but obviously the one that, you know, everyone wants is the Amiga 1200 version, and we want one for the 4000 as well, the higher-end Amigas. So last week we had Gunnar from the Vampire team on, and he was kind of saying, you know, the team kind of want to know how much people are willing to spend on the Amiga 1200 version, for example, because they kind of got two things they could do. Now, the one you bought, how much is that? Um, mine was about, I think it was 160 euros or yeah. something like that, but I got the upgraded... Uh, faster version. Yeah, I think mine's about 140, I think, with yeah. shipping. So, I mean, you know, these accelerators are, you know, that's about the same price as buying like a, an O30. Yeah, yeah. You totally. know what I mean? <laughs> like you get so much more. But he was saying last week that they've actually got the capability of making the Amiga 1200 version much, much, much more powerful. But this might mean that, you know, they have like an expansion board where you actually change the FPGA course. Yeah, yeah. So they were saying, how much are you going to spend on this or are you willing to spend on this and we've got on the website a wonderful conversation going on on last week's ed um in the comments section of last week's show it's really good and we did a poll as well so we've had 206 people voting yeah um my poll making is not the best so it's not the most accurate <laughs> but i will say the range of 200 to 300 say 350 it got 72 votes right. so okay. you know that's got the big biggest percentage at the moment so which I think is quite interesting because, you know, when we said that, I mean, you know, Gunnar was saying last week, he was kind of unsure how much people would want to spend, you know, whether the vampire price at the moment is already kind of, you know, pushing it a but little bit. But that's double it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're talking people are willing to pay double that. And I think, you know, we have said before that the Amiga is not a cheap hobby. Neither is any retro no, system no, no. these days. So yeah. I think, you know, it, it's a testament to their great work as well that people are willing to fork out a few more quid for the performance of it. So, yeah. We, but hey, I'd say, you know, the second place... Was four hundred to six hundred quid. No, yeah. four hundred to five hundred. So you know, people are still pretty, <laughs> pretty willing to spend in the Amiga scene. Yeah. So uh, you know, we've got time to save up for that performance, haven't we? If yeah. you want it. So uh, <laughs> we're going to pass it on to the Vampire team. So thank you so much for voting in the poll, guys. We really appreciate that. <laughs> this is really, really cool. You spotted this article on Gizmodo of a wooden mini console. Yeah. So in the uh, mini console wars, we've got all these crappy little plastic ones coming out <laughs> and this is an absolute beautiful piece that was displayed at gamescon and it's called the 8-bit dough now 8-bit dough are a company out there they're the ones behind the they're the bluetooth nintendo controllers that we covered ah okay so they've um they've made this and this you know it kind of reminds me a bit of like you know the really early kind of space wars machines and that you know the commodore pet had that curved monitor yeah, yeah. What they thought future would look like in like the 60s and 70s. Or the first Pong machine. It looks a bit like you'd find it either in the 70s or in Metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, there's a comment on this article here. It looks like every bit of furniture my parents had in their, in their house in the 70s, which it absolutely does. It is. I mean, there's not really much information on exactly what this thing is. It's just a little wooden arcade machine, really. It, it looks, says it plays MAME. I'm looking at it here. I mean, it does look like a MAME cabinet, but it's, it's very small. I mean, it's a little tabletop thing, isn't it, by the looks of it? Yeah, but I think this just looks like a, a beautiful aesthetic piece to have in your house. You know, if you're one of these posh minimalist people, <laughs> this would look beautiful just on an empty shelf. 
Or even for like, you know, trendy kind of bars and stuff. Oh, like, yeah. It'd be quite yeah. nice in them, wouldn't it? And I mean... Um... You have to stop and get a nick, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially around here. Yeah. Um, but it just does look, I mean, it, it is, like you said, it, it's it's quite a work of art, really. It's uh, it's not wood grain. This is actually bent wood. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, it, yeah. yeah, it's really nicely made. So um, we haven't really got much more, inf- more information on when this is coming out or pricing or anything like that. But from what we do know, they put a little uh, post on their Facebook page. Uh, we'll link you up on that in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, this was pretty funny in the week. Do you remember Late Night on BBC Two back in the 90s? Now, really early. I think it was probably the first BBC show about the internet. And it was a show called um, The Net. Yeah, I remember The Net, yeah. And it used to be on, I think it was like a Tuesday night around like 9, 10 o'clock it used to be on. I remember watching it. And there are a couple of episodes of it now on YouTube. There's only about three of them, I think. They haven't covered them all at the moment. And, you know, the BBC haven't got these in their archives or anything. But I was watching one of them. I think it was episode number five. I was watching on YouTube the other day. And in there, this is so funny, they've actually got a little section in there. Bear in mind, this is 1994. Yeah. Talking about video streaming. Okay. And one of the presenters is walking around a blockbuster video store. (laughs) Sorry, you've just... Yeah, yeah, keep going. I'll tell (laughs) you after. He's on the phone with... A guy called uh, Gary Geddes. Now, Gary was the um, international vice president of Blockbuster Video at the time of this recording. And the presenter asked him, do you think there's any future in streaming video services? And this is what he said. Do you think video on demand is going to take off in this country? No, I don't. Uh, I think the digital superhighway is something from a technology standpoint that is coming in the future, but there are a lot of questions that have to be answered. Um... Obviously, I think the the highway as it's being presented today is is overrated. The the concern of cost is going to be a very expensive uh, avenue for customers, and the question is who's going to end up paying for it. Uh, And the other thing is, do customers really want uh, the technology advancements (laughs) that are being talked about on the digital superhighway? In the States, we've had pay-per-view for well over 10 years, and it currently represents only less than 1% of the revenues generated for movies. Yeah, so that is a, a completely wrong move. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that Blockbuster had a time that they could buy Netflix? Yeah. They yeah. got offered it for, like, next to nothing, I think, in the early 2000s, and they turned it down. So I watched this video this week, which was React. You know, kids react to Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. And they had kids react to Blockbuster. 99% of the kids didn't remember it at all. Whoa. Didn't even remember going to the shop. One of them was like, oh, that shop that closed down down the road, you know. And they kept saying, oh, no, we just go on Netflix now. And I just I just wish they would have turned around and said, you know, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy it. <laughs> it's like crazy. But that, I mean, you know, that quote there, that must still haunt the guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. that, that is kind of up there with, you know, when Decca Records didn't sign the Beatles. That's yeah, kind of yeah, that level of like right. fail, isn't it? You know what I mean? In hindsight, here and I mean, you know, I don't think the guy was completely ridiculous. I mean, you look at 1994. I mean, you know, he didn't even have like what 30, 33 kilobit dial up then, but, did but you? What like... did they try after that? Blockbuster.com or it was really silly. I remember um, my friends all worked in Blockbuster. We used to go there. We used to get loads of stuff, and then mm-hmm. it just went so quickly. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Well, even like Netflix started as a like, DVD rental. They still do that, actually. But obviously, uh, yeah, I remember Love Film as well. Yeah, yeah they're right. still around. That's you know, a streaming service as well. But I think you know, I can kind of see where he was coming from. I mean, in 1994, I think you know anyone that kind of had a long term vision, you know, they did have a massive mess up by not getting into that. You know, when everyone else was doing yeah. it. And I know they did try, like, about, what, 2008, nine. By then, it was way too late. But I can kind of see where he was coming from in, you know, if you put your 1994 head on, it certainly wasn't ready for that kind of digital streaming video back then, was it? But just hearing that, though, it does kind of make you cringe a bit, doesn't it? Like, oh, God, yeah. You got that wrong. What, what if, eh? <laughs> but there was actually, uh, there was a thread on Reddit the other day um, talking about abandoned blockbuster stores and how many of them are still out there in, like, you know, rural America and that it's kind that of South thing. South Park episode where he buys the blockbuster store, Randy does. I'm going to make it successful at the very end. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, it's just, it was actually a video on YouTube, and if I'm fine, I'll put it in our show notes, but they were going around just like, you know, there's a lot of old blockbuster stores with, like, weeds and, like, trees over covering it, but it's kind of still there, like, kind of... Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, or the, the, you know, the ticket, the outline of the, the ticket. Ads, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's... Um, but apparently, I was watching this video, and there is still two blockbuster video stores in America open. 
Still going, <laughs> still going strong. What do you think they've just gone independent? Or yeah, they, that's what yeah, they've yeah. done. Yeah, but they still license the names. That someone does own the name and just use it for online purposes now. I think it's like okay. a, some kind of website still up, like Woolies. Yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> like that pretty much. But it's uh, it is kind of sad how quickly Blockbuster went away. I mean, you know, our local one here in you know in West Bridgeford in Nottingham that I closed down about two years ago, but it feels like an eternity ago now. Yeah, like, totally. And the fact that kids can't remember it now oh, just oh, shows dude. how much it's changed. <laughs> We're getting old fast. Yeah. <laughs> this next story is pretty interesting. Now, obviously, we had David Doak on not long ago. Um, Golden Eye. 007, amazing game. Um, rare, obviously, we're talking about that on that episode. If yeah. you didn't check that out, definitely um, have a look back in our show history. Uh, but this turns out that there has been some footage unveiled um, of GoldenEye 007 on the Xbox 360 that never got released. Yeah, on the Xbox Live Arcade. So they were going to release this, and it, it, it looks quite complete, you know, and it's, an, a, it's a direct version of mm. the N64 one. So it's completely intact it's got all the same levels game sound effects and everything i don't know why it wasn't released it's a proper hd upgrade as well the yeah. graphics look gorgeous on it. Yeah. it i think it's insane they didn't release that i mean just imagine being able to play that on like xbox live oh my god that would have been <laughs> that <is> sold loads <laughs> insane sold loads <laughs> and talking of that golden eye fans um one thing that we haven't mentioned recently that's come out has been golden eye sauce and this is insane so if you want to play a, a modern modded version it's on the source engine mm -hmm. source 5.0 and um you can play multiplayer you can do golden gun you can do all the old kind of golden eye stuff on there and it's got all the music and everything so and that's free is it as well yeah yeah because okay. it's on source that's really cool yeah. I, I am a bit more of a, a console gamer. I know you're you're very much in the PC kind of. Uh... Well, I, I like the controller for GoldenEye. Actually, it's one of the only games I played on the N64. <laughs> that <laughs> controller is. I think it's kind of. It was designed obviously for Super Mario 3D, but it does. That's one of the few games where I actually feel comfortable with it as well. A yeah, lot of just games the you movement and flow on it is really nice. But right. I, you know, apparently this this didn't happen because of licensing issues. Apparently, but you know, they've got a bit to sort this out somehow. I'd I'd love this on like Xbox One or PS4. Oh, that would be amazing, yeah. Because yeah. it was just one of those classic games. Uh, it was a fun FPS, wasn't it? Well, it was That's really, you know, it was the first, um, really the first kind of multiplayer FPS. I mean, I remember playing like Gloom on the Amiga and stuff like that, which was a bit more primitive, but even you could have like four players on this, couldn't you? That was yeah, like, you yeah. Know, the first four-player game I ever played, like, you know, as an FPS game. And so. uh, Proximity Mines and stuff, that was great. <laughs> and uh, Dr. David Doak's, of course, in it, isn't he? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in it, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you want to see this kind of, um, you know, uncovered footage as well, maybe it'll make an appearance one day. We'll shove that in this week's show notes. Now, before we get into uh, this week's special guest, Steve Ince, speaking of classic games that are making a comeback, do you remember Body Blows by Team 17? Yeah, I totally remember Body Blows and Body Blows Galactic as well, because I used to play that demo till the disc was rotted and falling to bits. You <laughs> so know? you have a demo version, did you? Yeah, magazine? yeah, I never, I never had the full version. <laughs> I know, looking in hindsight now, a lot of people kind of write Body Blows as a bit of a crap game. But at the time, I mean, Street Fighter 2 was obviously big on the Super Nintendo. But the version I played on the Amiga was so slow and oh, yeah. rubbish. You know, this was wonderful compared to it. Oh, Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga was crap. Yeah, yeah. awful. But um, Which I think, you know, in hindsight, that's probably why a lot of people loved Body Blows on the Amiga because you had Mortal Kombat 1 came out on the Amiga, which I thought was actually a pretty good port. Yeah. Um, Street Fighter 2, I think, might come out after Body Blows. But around yeah. that time, this was like, you know, everyone was in the fighting game craze at the time. So Yeah, they had a Final Fight as well, Fighting Spirit, um, mm -hmm. Elf Mania, which is, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, there's loads. <laughs> but um, you but know, this... I always had a bit of in my heart for Body Blows, you know, also because it was Team 17 and uh, uh, Alistair Brimble music. You yeah. Know? We mentioned when we had a LGR on the show the other week about how games at one time have got a good reputation, but that can change over time based on what people online say. And now whenever you read about Body Blows, everyone's talking about how bad it was. But at the time, it was a very highly rated game. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I used to enjoy it as well. Me and my brother used to play it for hours. But the good news is, if you are a little bit nostalgic for it, they've now released a free version of it for the PC and the Mac. That's cool. Uh, so it's still the Team 17 version and everything. But yeah, but it's it, free. It's had a few upgrades as well, 256 colour graphics. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's on this uh, website, Games Nostalgia. So what it is, you just download, um, you know, we, we've mentioned some of their games before where you kind of download it and it kind of it runs in a wrapper 
Oh, okay. She's playing yeah, like yeah. the EXE straight away. So I think it's the Amiga version that's emulated, but it, you know, it does seem this emulation of it. So if you're uh, getting a bit nostalgic for body blows, I know there are fans out there. What's that guy um, when he beats you? What does he always say? Which what, what are you thinking, Mike, the security guy? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, we played it, didn't we, over Christmas? Yeah. It was like, yeah, uh, my skills on body blows are not what they were. So uh, <laughs> might give this a download and do a bit of practice. It. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so polite. Yeah. <laughs> right, guys, thank you so much for checking out episode number 35 of the Retro Hour. We'll be out again next Friday, available from SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, all your favourite podcast clients. Keep an eye out for Ravi on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, and... Uh, Keep listening to the podcast, and we've noticed loads of people are listening on G Podder. Oh, I really? I don't know what G Podder is, but wicked. Because <laughs> yeah, Ravi goes really in depth in the stats, don't you? You'll yeah, be like yeah. messaging me, you know, we we have like thirty new listeners this week in like Peru. What's going on there? What was one of the, LGR's episode? Where was that massive? Uh, Helsinki, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's so interesting. We could look at these stats all day, but. So shout out to our listeners in Helsinki if yeah, you are new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, do check out Facebook. Ravi's going to be doing another live stream this weekend and uh, hopefully we'll have a few more, you know, maybe some games in the future. Any yeah. recommendations of any live streams or Yeah, anything like you want us to do. Like... <laughs> yeah, well, within reason. Yeah, <laughs> limitation. Yeah. So uh, like the Facebook page, search for the Retro Hour podcast. We'll be out again next Friday and for the next half an hour then, one for the hardcore adventure heads. Here he is, Steve Ince on the Retro Hour. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. So, Steve, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming on the Retro Art Hour podcast this week. You're yeah, well, very welcome. Now, let's start right at the beginning. What was your first experience with a computer? Um, I actually um, bought myself a Commodore 64. Blimey, when was that? <laughs> I can't even remember when it was. Early 80s, I think. Um, and I, I fiddle around with a bit with that. Obviously, m- mostly used it for playing games. Um, there was a fantastic game called The Staff of Karnath, which was my favourite for ages. Uh, and I never completed it. <laughs> but, you know, sort of, uh, I, I spent many an hour trying to. But this this was really clever. It, used, it did some very clever stuff with sprites because you could only have um, two colour sprites on the Commodore 64. It actually kind of, kind of combined sprites to make them you know so you had a character with four colors by combining two sprites into one you know and it was it was very clever stuff um so you're wandering around this house collecting all these all these items um and then you had to take them one at a time down into the cellar to to put them into this this receptacle and when you got all 16 then you kind of like you'd won Mm -hmm. except you had to do it all by midnight and I think the game started at 8 p.m. So it's like four hours, um, except one room you went into, time sped up. <laughs> <laughs> so so you had to be very clever, very um, very quick. And I, I just never never completed that. But it was just such a brilliantly, you know, sort of, just so well put together. And also it was the first time I'd seen it proper animation in sprites as well. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of you had these little white birds flying across the screen that, you know, were properly animated and it was really brilliant so would you say that was what really got you interested in kind of the you know design process of games um no not really because i mean this was early 80s and i didn't join the games industry until 93 mm-hmm. um so whilst you know sort of i i did do some design you know and i thought oh i'll, I'll you know i'll have a go at doing this I, I couldn't get the coding you know sort of like i couldn't get my head around the coding i couldn't get beyond basic really so, so I couldn't really get the Commodore 64 to do what I wanted. <laughs> well, I, I think I was, I think I was trying, trying, you know, my my ideas of what should what a game should be were too, were too big for my abilities, shall we say? <clears throat> well, I know you did a, a degree in astronomy and astrophysics. So, how did that change, like, to doing video games then? Well, back then, I mean, I finished my degree in '79. And, you know, kind of like computers in, in universities were, were pretty um, odd things. I mean, they were powerful, but, you know, you had to kind of like put your programs in and punch cards and things like this, you know. And it was, <laughs> it, it, was it, it wasn't something that appealed to me. It just did, you know, sort of being a, a fan of the film 2001 A Space Odyssey and seeing all the great, you know, displays on that, on, on you know, the, the computer screens in the, uh, spacecraft. I just I, I thought they were just fantastic, and thought that's what that's what computers should be. So when you see 
you know come to to deal with a, a computer that ha, you know has punch cards as a as an input it just you know nah, nah, this isn't right you know <laughs> and so you know kind of like when when computer games started taking off computers in general i guess really you know kind of like with, with the mac the first Macs was sort of um, being seen as kind of like the 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 way forward with um, graphics and things like this. Um, the PCs were obviously seen as you know sort of for the time fairly powerful um, gaming platforms. So it was it was quite an interesting time. And then you know kind of like I was forced into a career choice career change um, and thought I've got to do something creative. I got to do something with computers. So. <laughs> how did you it kind, um, of, it kind of blossomed from there really how did you um find revolution then um well we were both in hull i mean i, I lived in hull and, and revolution at the time were based in hull and a friend of a friend sort of said oh well you know i know that revolution are looking for somebody um take along your portfolio so i did <laughs> so in spite of the fact that you know sort of i got a degree in astronomy and astrophysics i i took along an artistic portfolio and got a job as an artist. <laughs> so, so that was my first job, doing background paintings and sprite animations, things like this. And that was um, for Beneath a Steel Sky? Yes, I did I did a few um, background paintings for that, but I was mostly doing sprites, you know, background sprites, like steam escaping from a, from a pipe or rocks falling from the ceiling, things like this. But yeah, it was, it was fascinating. It was great to work with other talented sprite artists as well as it the one particular guy called steve odes who taught himself to animate on an amiga and com considering he's completely self-taught you know so it was just brilliant you know he could do things with pixels that i don't think anybody else could it's such a fantastic story driven game and kind of joining and that must have been amazing with the whole space theme and sci-fi stuff that you liked as well yes yes and 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 the fact that you know sort of um the fact that it, it was a story driven game the fact that the, you know the characters were so good and 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 also you know the fact that it had dave dave gibbons involved you know i mean i mean that was just you know brilliant because I'd, I'd sort of like loved dave gibbons stuff stuff for a while you know with his watchman and uh, Martha Washington goes to war and and, and things like this, which were uh, you know so, sort of uh, relevant at that time. You know, obviously got to meet him, and it was <laughs> a bit of a fanboy moment at that at that particular point. But um, he was great. D Dave Gibbons was absolutely great. When we got into Broken Sword, I started doing some initial uh, concept work, but you know because we were trying to push things so hard, we brought in some guys from the old Don Bluth Studios in Ireland. And they were just brilliant. They were just kind of like, you know, a completely different level of, of art. Um, and they brought so much experience and skill that, that we all learned so much. It's just incredible. I mean, when you look at the broken sword backgrounds and, and the quality of them, they're just as good now. I mean, you know, sort of like, okay, the, the resolution isn't as, as such a good quality as, as probably we, we hoped, you know, kind of like to play these days. But, you know, the, the actual quality behind them is, is, is still some of the best, I think, that's, that's been in games. So it, was, what, it was really good to kind of like work with those guys. So when you did start, how far along was um, Beneath the Steel Sky? Um, probably about 50%, I think. You know, they had, they had quite a lot of um, locations designed and you know sort of like in the process of being you know the backgrounds being painted and things like this one of the things that that i first did was to actually take some of the the painted backgrounds um done done from um dave gibbons sketches um and make sure that they actually um worked on both P pc and amiga because amiga was was 32 colors <laughs> and so you take a a nice painted um painted background scan it in convert it down to 256 colours for the PC, but then you have to convert it down again to 32 colours for the Amiga. That's quite a downgrade, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and, and you can't just do a conversion because it, it sort of like, it's, it, was, it just creates really horrible results. So what you have to do is you have to actually reduce the palette one colour at a time and saying, oh, well, you know, kind of those two colours are close together, we can combine those and things. So it was quite a, a time-consuming process. And then, you know, so like you get it down to 32 colours, which had to include colours for the sprites, you know, the, the, the character sprites. Um, so it was, <laughs> you know, sort of 
incredible the, the, the amount of work that we put in to making those uh, Amiga screens as, as good as we could. One thing I, I know about that game, I mean, it's one of my all-time favourite adventure games, is, you know, there are really strong characters in there as well. Mm. And, uh, you know, you guys did an amazing job actually getting emotions into, like, such small, you know, characters on the screen. Was it difficult conveying emotion with such a small, like, pixel space? Again, it goes back to, you know, Steve Odds. I mean, he was just such a good uh, animator. And, and a lot of the characters, the original character designs were done by... Um, Dave Gibbons. So it was a combination of the design of the characters, the way they were animated, and of course the way they were written. You know, I mean, you think about Joey. I mean, he doesn't have any facial expression or anything, but his lines, you know, uh, are quite sarcastic and, you know, sort of, um, you know, quite quite funny um, in the way he responds to to Foster. So, you know, sort of like the, the writing there, um, which was, was all done by a guy called uh, Dave Cummins. I mean, he was just brilliant and, and he really captured so much. And I think that the way those things all came together really kind of like made it stand out. And, you know, so I look at some of those some of those lines and some of those characters and I wish I had created them at the time because they were just brilliant. Totally, because the text version, you'd even get how Joey was. But mm. when you heard the talky version, it was a whole, <laughs> a whole new, you know, kind of uh, way of yeah, seeing him. Yeah. Did you have any much involvement in the talky version of it then? Uh, only in the sense that I cut up all the samples. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were great voices, some of those. <laughs> it's the most boring job ever. <laughs> How did you do the act? I mean, that was very, very early days of you know CD talky. I've got the CD thirty two version, and uh, I. <laughs> I think it's, um, is it Lamb who's got a really strong like Sheffield accent? Yes, yeah, yes. that is so funny. <laughs> well, who, who did the acting for it then? Was it all done in-house or did you uh, hire people for it? Um, it? It was all done down in London, um, you know, proper recording studio and everything, mm-hmm. um, which was a bit of a first, I think, in, in Britain. I think, I think um, Sierra had, had beaten us to it with one of the King's Quest games. And of course, you know, sort of like there was, you know, LucasArts were, were sort of like making forays into it. Because you know, sort of, it was it was you know at the time of the first um, CDs that came that came out. So people were getting CD drives, and so they were looking for games that would t- you know sort of like benefit from that. So you know, sort of like Steel Sky was was one, and all the voices were recorded onto DAT tapes. You know, sort of, which was kind of like the the standard at the time. Of course, now everything's just dumped onto CD or DVD and, and, and so on. But uh, then, you know, kind of like those DAT tapes became very precious, <laughs> <laughs> and and we had to convert them from the DAT tapes into digital format so we could um, chop them up into individual lines. Uh, and there was no automatic way of doing it. I mean, most most studios these days can do it fairly quickly and automatically. You know, they look for the beginning and ends of lines. And, and and you know sort of like crop them you know quite cleverly but we had to do it all by hand (laughs) was it a conscious decision to kind of make the the voices you know almost like kind of bordering on like really eccentric and uh you know really really definitely yes i mean it's it's definitely seen as a as a as a comedy game Mm -hmm. in in many respects i mean obviously there was a there was a rich story but you know kind of like all these characters had their own kind of little agendas and stuff like this so so you know kind of they may not think of themselves as funny, you know, kind of to themselves, but it's just the way they con, you know, their their voices and their characters conflict with other others, that, that creates that humour, and and that's one of the strengths of of good humour is that you know you get that conflict, and it's what it's not dramatic conflict, it's humorous conflict, and and this is, you know, sort of where where the where the strength grows, and of course if you got a, you got somebody like Lamb who has a very, you know, sort of strong Yorkshire accent and and you know sort of like a bit bit full of himself then then his own pomposity and and the way he speaks becomes you know comedy in itself even though he's not saying directly funny lines apart from the bit about his, uh, his beaver fur coat i remember that oh yeah yeah, <laughs> like that. yeah. <laughs> well obviously when, when that game came out it got a really good reception i remember you know reviews in like amiga format and ceo amiga mm-hmm. saying you know it was one of the standout um, adventure games on the amiga you, were you guys really happy with the reception that it got? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, so you, you look, you know, you look at some of the reviews. I mean, I think there's ninety three percent and ninety four percent on on some of the magazines, and it was just such a, you know, kind of like a pleasure. I mean, I suppose it because the, the, when I joined Revolution, I think there were seven or eight of us, so you're kind of part of a small team, you know. And obviously, we brought in some some 
um, people to do various other jobs as well, something to do with the music and things like this. Um, but the core, the core team was very small. So you feel as though you're kind of like you're contributing quite substantially to to a project like that. So when it does get good reviews and you know sort of it, it it's well received, then then you, you know you do feel as though you know you've 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 helped that. And I think that we all were really pleased with with the way it was uh, received. And the uh, music was fantastic. I remember that as well. The whole kind of package was great. Even the yeah. Um, yeah. The design of the box with the uh, kind of black <laughs> with the uh, you know yeah, the fronts on it yeah. was great. Virgin who released it. I mean, they they were really keen on on doing a good job with the marketing and packaging and everything. And they they brought the whole team, you know, kind of like up to um, Hull to talk about it. And it was just really weird. Yeah, it was kind of like this this whole marketing and and product team just came up to to talk about how best they would they would um, market the game, and it's brilliant. Was there any plans for a sequel of Beneath the Steel Sky back then? Oh, we, we've talked we've talked about it on and off for, for you know sort of a long time, but um, you never really pushed it beyond that. Um, I know at one time we we toyed with the idea of making the sequel as a, a kind of RPG, more, well, more of an adventure RPG, but you know that kind of expansive exploratory um, you know sort of um, approach. Um, where you know you'd go on side missions and things like this, um, but um, but that never came to anything. I mean, we did we did write a few you know bits and pieces of story ideas and and so on. But <laughs> do, do you remember any of that then? What it was going to be about? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> one one thing I wanted to do, and I don't know whether whether Charles would ever have agreed to this, is I wanted it to be. To, to, to run straight on from from the end of the first one. I mean, so many games, it's kind of like, you know, six months later or f- five years later and things like this. Um, but I just thought that it would be it would be so cool that, you know, so it starts at the very moment that the, the helicopter is flying away at the end and maybe it explodes or something like this. <laughs> Get shot you down. Know, so, <laughs> so, so it seems as though you've killed Foster off at the very beginning and it's kind of like, yeah, you know, but... Would he or wouldn't he be killed? I don't know. I mean, we'd have to wait. But we never got beyond that, you see. So. <laughs> well, I know in more recent years, there was a, obviously a remastered version on um, on iOS um, that got some really good praise. And I do remember Dave Gibbons actually saying, I think it was about four years ago, that you know, they were looking at doing a sequel now. I mean, do you know well, if yes, there's anything been about talking that? about it. You know, and, and I know that they've got some ideas, um, but I haven't been involved with that, unfortunately. Um, it's just one of those things, you know, sort of. But I, I know that... Um, Dave Gibbons and Charles have been talking on and off, <laughs> you know, about things for for a long time, you know, sort of. But uh, you know, hopefully, you know, they'll do something and, and we'll get a a good uh, sequel at some point. We'll see. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be worth the wait, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I hope so. Yes, yes. As long as they capture that same feel for the characters. I mean, not. I don't think that you need the same visual style, but um, certainly the same tone for for the writing and the and and the level of story and 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 things like this and the way that you interact with the characters would be good well um we were talking about the broken sword franchise earlier and Mm. it's actually europe's most successful adventure series did you guys think it would go down that well no not really um because i don't think you can think in those terms well i mean we wanted to i think we, we were the first game to go from 320 by 240 up to um, 640 by 480, um, which was, you know, it doesn't seem like a big jump <laughs> these days. But, I mean, that's a heck of a lot more detail than, than we were used to. And and we sort of went off in, in odd directions artistically for a while. And it wasn't really until we talked to the Don Bluth guys that we, we really got a handle on... on you know the visual style that we needed to to meet that that high resolution, and also we talked to some guys from a company called Red Rover who did some character design work. So so they <clears throat> they designed um, George and Nico and, and a number of the others visually um, on paper mm-hmm. before it was before it even went into the computer. So we had you know a good idea of of 
where these where these characters were going and 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 these drawings were really excellent you know sort of like detailed drawings really sharp you know sort of like if you wanted to to put those same drawings into into a game now you could because the quality is just so good and i know that when broken sword 5 was in development they actually went back to those original drawings yeah. um as a as a starting point for for kind of like reworking the 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 characters um at that much higher resolution for you know for the latest game and i think that that's necessary really you've got to kind of be true to the original well, if you can <clears throat> but looking at that era i mean it did kind of seem like you know if you look at like 1990 to like 96 though those like you know that half a decade really i mean Start of the decade, the Commodore 64 was still selling really well. And then by like 96, mm-hmm. you know, it was like you said 256 colors, like you're using CD ROM technology. Did it kind of feel like there was massive leaps in tech every like six months or so? Oh, definitely, yes. And and I think you, you get an element of that now. I mean, I think you've always had an element of that, you know, with new, new, you know, sort of like consoles coming out every so often and, and things like this. I think it's slowed down a bit now. It's quite incredible, really, because I remember. Um, we thought it was a huge deal when we got our first PC with four megabytes of RAM, you know, four and eight gig of standard now. <laughs> but, you know, you in 20 years, we've come on a thousandfold in, 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 in these kind of things, you know. But that was so expensive as well. You know, sort of like four meg of RAM was something like 100 quid. That was just a fortune. I think... Um... <laughs> That kind of period of time was a real change in point-and-click games as well, when uh, more animation started coming in and stuff like Day mm. of the Tentacle would come out, and you know, and it all kind of moved onto the PC. Yes, um, and I think that um, I think interfaces started improving as well, and I think that the I think Beneath the Steel Sky and Broken Sword helped an awful lot in improving the point-and-click interface. I mean, you look at the, the LucasArts games and they had all those kind of like words, didn't they, at the bottom of the screen, mm-hmm. you know, so like give, take and all these kind of things. It just made it quite clunky, you know, having to click on one of these words and then click on an object and so on. So um, I know that, that in Beneath Steel Sky, we streamlined that. So you either left clicked or right clicked on something, whether you wanted to examine it or, or interact with it. And then we developed that a bit further with, um, with Broken Sword. And of course, with Broken Sword, we also introduced the idea of icons instead of putting a, a lines of text on screen to choose from. We put icons so you could see that, oh, if you're going you know, to put an icon of a fish, then you're going to talk to this character about a fish. You know, and, and so it, it, it changed a number of things. You know, and, and, and the icon system might not be perfect and might not be to everybody's taste. But I think that we, you know, that streamlining just you know, sort of helps us concentrate on, on the content so much more. Well, um, was that using the virtual theatre engine? Um, virtual theatre was really only properly used in, in um, Lower of the Temptress. Okay. Kind of, we sort of tried to use it in Beneath Steel Sky. We didn't have that kind of like, you know, sort of world that was internally alive, if you know what I mean. In Lure of the Temptress, all those characters wandered around the world, um, whether you were taking any notice of them or not. Um, but the the thing about Broken Sword was that, you know, kind of like we we did things that nobody else had done at that at that point. Take George's sprite character, for instance. We wanted that that sprite to to scale to match the um, perspective of the locations, uh, which no one else had done. Some had tried it, but with, without doing it properly. Um, so we actually actually, could, actually had to come up with a formula that would that would do this, and it couldn't be a fixed formula because some of the screens were at different angles than others. So your, hori- your horizon line would be at a different height up the screen, or, or maybe even off the screen altogether. Um, so you had to create a, we had to create a system that scaled those characters to match the perspective, no matter what that perspective was. You know, sort of how how shallow or or steep the floor was. Um, so it was the only time I've used my <laughs> my maths to um, come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> I created these formulas, and um, the programmers then developed the systems that were required to to do this. Um, but not only that, 
um, the animators then created a, a set of sprites that did very clever stuff um, that turned George in, a, in, in certain ways um, to, to completely scale. So not only did, you, did they scale the, the sprites themselves, the scale, the, the rate at which the character walked up the screen as well. So, so it was, it, you know, as he got smaller, it, w- it would move slower. So everything was in perspective. Everything matched perspective and foreshortening and everything. So it was, <laughs> it was a very clever system. The, the programmers did brilliantly. I think as well when you look at it, it probably looks so natural that people wouldn't really like put two and two together. But that much thought's actually gone into it. Oh yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that that always struck me was that you know you get these you get some of these games that were, were getting awards for animation and they weren't as well animated as as um, as Broken Sword. Yeah. But because we were doing or oh, the animators were were doing this this clever stuff, you didn't notice because it was so good. You know, it was what people expected of good quality. <laughs> You know, so it's it's one of those things that is so good you don't notice. Well, was George a fun character to work on? I mean, he always seemed, you know, he's a bit of a dweeb, but he he was very lovable, wasn't he? Um, well, that that was his real strength, wasn't it? You know, the fact that he's you know kind of like a typical everyman character. You know, he's an ordinary bloke. He's gone on holiday to Paris, and suddenly, you know, sort of someone's nearly killed him with a bomb in a cafe. You know, not surprising. He's a bit pissed off with. Um, <laughs> The fact that that you know is 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 nearly met his maker as it were, and so he he kind of like he's not happy with what the police say. He's not ha- you know, and when he meets uh, Nico and talks to her, she mentions something that oh that's some big conspiracy. So he, he gets involved, and and it's kind of like the way he gets involved, and the way that the kind of like the the puzzles match his investigation. You know, it, it all kind of like links in together so he's looking for clues you know about who this this um this clown character is you know who is this who is this guy who is you know so so if you know he goes down he follows him down into the sewers uh you know kind of and he finds a couple of clues down there one's one's a red nose clown's nose and another one's a tissue with some makeup on and it all kind of fits you see it's the sort of thing that 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 makes sense within the investigation that's going on. And that's what one thing that we really kind of like wanted to, to kind of run with it, that idea that, you know, kind of like the, the, the puzzles were logical and, you know, kind of like weren't anything outrageous, you know, like making a, Mustache from Cat Hair. And- <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always thought that. I mean, Broken Sword is one game I'd always recommend to people that are new to adventure games because I think, like you said, the you know, there's not too much like kind of cryptic stuff like that in there. Which um, that was a conscious decision then, was it, to do that? Mm. Yes, yeah, so we wanted we wanted all the all the puzzles to make you know kind of lo- logical sense within the world that we had created. Now, obviously, there's 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 bits of history in there, and there's bits places where we we. We stretch that history a bit, <laughs> you know. It's kind of like the 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 merging of fact and fiction is is um, is is what another thing that I think gives it its strength. I mean, you know, sort of like there's been plenty of other um, fictional stories that that have u- used that. Obviously, the um, Da Vinci Code was was a prime example. <laughs> um, where, whatever you think of of the quality of that i mean you know sort of it, it, it had some clever ideas so so the fact that that you know there was the, there is this kind of like historical background that that has has truth to it that which we then laid on you know a fictional story um helped and so in order to to build on that we have to create something that is logical so uh, later on, you moved the series of Broken Sword into the world of 3D. How did that go <laughs> down? Um, mixed feelings, really. Um, I, I liked I liked the move to 3D in 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 that game. Anyway, um, it was it gave us a way to you know kind of think differently, and and yet still, I think remain reasonably faithful to the to the original uh maybe the, maybe the character designs were you know sort of like went a bit too far or something like this it became a bit more real um but you know i mean all of the locations and the, and the guys the, the the technical guys did some very clever stuff with with lighting and shadows to create some very 
you know, very beautiful um, locations. And it was it was good fun to work on. Um, but at the same time, there were things that, that obviously didn't quite work so well. You know, sort of like we, we thought we'd, we'd come up with a quite a cool idea with the, the, the box puzzles and pushing crates around and stuff. But then so many people decided that they didn't like that. So <laughs> it wasn't quite the winner we were hoping for. Well, I mean, did you kind of feel pressured to move into 3D, though? Because every, everyone was doing 3D at that oh, point, Oh, definitely, they? yes. I mean, you know, sort of we weren't going to get published without, without it being in 3D because, you know, sort of like the, the publishers all regarded 2D as being dead. I mean, you know, it was it was the way things were going at the time. I mean, the fact that things have swung back again, <laughs> you know, sort of like nothing's ever dead, it would seem. It was a bit frustrating, really. I mean, one of the problems with with, a ga- with games like Broken Sword One and Two is is the amount of um, animation that you need. The number of frames of animation was just unbelievable. You know, most of it had to be drawn by hand, converted into sprites, which you know is is a very expensive thing. Not only in terms of getting it drawn, but also I hate to have to do that again. So going to 3D was a way of kind of shortening some of that, because I mean, you know, sort of like when you create sprites, if you have a, an eight directional walk, you have to create an you know a walk cycle in each of those eight directions, and you have to have a pickup animation in each of those directions, and so on. Um, whereas with 3D, you only need to create one animation, and then the, and then the engine can can rotate that animation in any direction. You know, 360 degrees. You don't you're not restricted to eight eight directions. So so in some respects, it frees up resources for for other things. Did you think it, um, this kind of move to 3D caused a general decline of uh, adventure games in 2000? At that time, there was a decline in popularity. What I feel happened was that the the number of people playing adventure games was probably the same but the the number of people playing games as a whole was increasing and leaving adventures behind a little so you know kind of you know there were there were more people playing first person shooters and you know kind of like um you know tactical trading games and all these kinds of things um and and you know, so like the, the the Japanese RPGs were, were were becoming popular. You know, like the so Final Fantasy, those games, and you know the consoles were just were just huge. Um, and and adventures didn't weren't a natural fit for the consoles, and so you know, sort of it it, it wasn't so much that there were fewer play, people playing the adventures. It was that suddenly they were you know almost restricted to pc with a few making it onto the consoles and so you know sort of like they, they just got left behind rather than losing an audience and then the, there was a kind of like knock-on effect of that eventually when people just stopped funding you know the creation of of you know big uh, adventure titles so you know lucas art stopped making them sierra stopped making them everybody stopped making them you know, sort of like revolution had to look at other things, and obviously the first the first move was a kind of like two and a half D thing with with um, In Cold Blood, where we had pre rendered backgrounds and three D characters, and and that was that was a huge game really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was primarily an adventure game, but there was some action in it and so on. And then um, when the GBA came out, we actually did a, a version of Broken Sword One for the GBA. And we changed, we changed it. We changed the control. It was no longer point and click. It was direct control. You were steering the character around, which then kind of suggested, oh, this will work. Why don't we do this as a console? And that's what led into, into Broken Soul 3 as a 3D title. So <laughs> it's, all, it's all kind of linked. And then, and then things got a bit messy. <laughs> well, I was going to ask about that. I mean, obviously, we're getting to like, you know, into the 2000s. Like 2004 was obviously... Um... A pretty crappy year for Revolution, I think it's fair to say. Um, what what exactly yeah. went wrong there then? Well, um, we were trying to do a project, a, a kind of like investigative cop um, project. Can't even remember the title of it now. But um, you know, so like we we thought we were doing well. You know, we had some good um, concept art. We had some good initial model, you know, three D modeling and so on. And then the um, 
there's all sorts of problems with publishers and so on, and they just pulled the funding, which meant that um, Revolution had to make everybody redundant, which, <laughs> you know, sort of, as the oldest in the company, I kind of, like, went into panic mode. <laughs> We've well, been there, what, like, tw- 12 years at that point? Had you been there? Uh, 11 years, 11, yeah. yeah. So the first thing I did was sort of, like, start looking for another job, but then ultimately decided to go freelance. Well, one of the projects was a Broken Sword 5, um, which came out of a Kickstarter. Mm. Um, and that raised £823,000, which is incredible for a Kickstarter. Yeah, I didn't see any of that, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that just shows that the, the, there is an audience there. Um, and there is, a, there is a strong fan base still. I think that that you've got to work out how to connect with that fan base. Now, obviously, a company like Revolution can use their strong back catalogue to to leverage that fan base in in a positive way. And I think that that's exactly what they did. Uh, and they couldn't have done what they did without you know their their um, history of of providing you know good um, good games. They 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 didn't expect to do anywhere near as well as that. I think they were very um, pleased the way, the way it did happen. And I think that, you know, that it just shows the strength of the, you know, kind of the the the, um, the whole kind of like IP itself is, is you know, has has that kind of, so it encourages that kind of love, love of, you know, sort of the, the game itself. So, so it's, it's, um, it was great. I mean, I did some initial s- story work and some initial design work on that with Charles, uh, but then I had to move on to another project. It kind of um, it's one of the the problems of being freelance. You kind of um, you sign up to projects and then you know you have to sort of like come off other things sort of before you get finished, and it's it's a bit frustrating. So so you know I wasn't there when they were doing all the nitty gritty, as it were. So well, um, one IP that I noticed uh, that came out recently that's really funny is uh so blonde and that's kind of <laughs> that, was, that was that was about that's eight years ago <laughs> recently for me <laughs> but, <laughs> but um that's kind of harking back to it reminds me a bit of monkey islands or something and uh i'll just explain to my listeners it's about a 17 year old girl a sport girl with a rich parents and they're on a cruise and they end up uh, a lightning storm and she ends up in a 17th century pirate times with a mobile mm-hmm. phone and a credit card. So <laughs> how did that all come about? That was great. Well, Wizard Box, who developed the game, they were looking for a writer. And they wanted um, they wanted to write the game in English because obviously they wanted to hit as many markets as possible. And then they would do, you know, kind of like rewrite it in French and then get it translated into other languages as well. You know, because of my history with Revolution, they, they approached me and I went over to Paris and and met with them and we, we swapped ideas around. And and all they had at the time when I got involved with that was um, they had some character sketches and some background images of, of the beach. And that was it. I said, oh, we want, you know, we want this um, this girl to land on this, this island and, you know, sort of it, it's actually... A pirate island, so she's gone back in time, I think, and that's all they had. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, I had to kind of like work from there, um, which is great, you know. And and it was the first time I'd actually done the the story and and you know sort of like high level design, pretty much on my own. I mean, obviously, I was working with the guys at Wizard Box and sending them stuff, and they'd give feedback, and then I'd change things and change things back and change things again. <laughs> So, so you know, sort of. Um, I mean, you never completely work on your own, but you know, sort of like it's the first time I'd, I'd worked without other writers in the team. You know, sort of. I was a, you know, I, I I like to think that I was able to to learn from everything that, oh, sorry, use everything that I learned from um, my time at Revolution. Really, working with, you know, the, the writers there and people like Charles and Tony and Dave Sykes and, and you know sort of all these all these people who who you know kind of like helps me become able to to, to kind of like churn out a, 
a game like Sail Blonde. So. I imagine as well as a freelancer, you know, doing that kind of thing today, I mean, you know, you can just shove it on Dropbox or FTP it to them straight away. Compared to like 20 years ago when you'd have to put a floppy disk in the post, I imagine, you know, it's a lot easier today than it would have been back then. Yes, well, I mean, when I went with Revolution, I mean, I was with, with them for quite a while. Um, and so I wasn't working freelance until I, I left in 2004. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I, I know when we were using people... Well, if we go back to Beneath Steel Sky, we've got the background paintings, and then they'd be sent to us by, you know, sort of like registered post or something. <laughs> you know, so and we'd open them up, and then we'd have to get them scanned in. And I remember we had to we had to buy a scanner specifically for that. And and there were many scanners that would connect to a PC back then, and we paid seven or eight hundred quid for this scanner. That was a you know a huge amount of money. I mean, when you think that you know, twenty years later. You know, you can buy a scanner for next to nothing. <laughs> Twenty quid in Asda now, isn't it, or something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but but it was. I mean, that, that we put everything through that. We had to scan everything, and it was just brilliant. I think back then I had one of those crappy little black and white hand scanners. You know, you had to roll over the picture. <laughs> oh no, no, and they were horrible, weren't they? <laughs> Awful things. <laughs> you, know, you always kind of like jud- juddered at some point. <laughs> yeah. But no, they were. Um, this scanner was brilliant. It was just so good. Well, you also did a book about um, writing for video games as well. Mm. Um, how do you think writing for games differs from like other mediums, like you know, TV or film, or for example? If you write, if you write a novel, then obviously the writer is more or less completely in charge. You know, sort of obviously you, you, the editor will say, "Oh, you know, I don't think that's working," or, or so on. But but it's still down to the the writer to kind of make those changes and make it work and so on. As you move into other medium, it's media, you sort of. Um, it becomes more collaborative. Now, the, the writer may kind of like write a film script, say, and, and you know, sort of like pass it on to a director who then, who then kind of like makes the film. But it's, it's never straightforward. Like, it always goes through rewrites and, you know, and then, the, you know, the shooting version is always slightly different and so on. And then, it, you know, it may, it may, you know, get subtle changes in the editing and, and so on. And But where, where games differ is kind of like in the outset you have to think very differently you have to think interactively and you have to think about what the player is going to do you know when they're sat in in front of the console or in front of the pc or whatever or you know whether they're playing it on the phone or and so on what are they going to be thinking or how are they going to be making the choices they're making you know how how do you make the choices fair and interesting and and, and, and so on how do you kind of like lead them into this kind of like investigation if you if you've got a game like broken sword how do you kind of let, lead them down the path to investigate this this bombing and 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 everything that goes with it well in recent years i know we've had games like um you know the quantic dreams game stuff like heavy rain and beyond two souls and more recently indie games like life is strange um mm. do you think adventures had a bit of a, a comeback recently um, oh, definitely, and I think that they, they've kind of like come back in a different way. Um, but also, I get a bit frustrated sometimes because you know you see a lot of adventures that are really kind of like trying to recreate the '90s, and I think that's a slight mistake. You know, you, not only are they kind of like written in exactly the same way as, as Monkey Island or, or, or you know Indiana Jones or something like this. Um, they often have the similar interfe- interfaces, and, that, and they're often low res. And and you think, why? You know, why put all that work into creating these these pixel sprites when you know you can you know do do exactly the same amount of work and create something better? <laughs> you, you wouldn't have made an Amiga game that looked like a Commodore sixty four game on purpose, would you? No, exactly. <laughs> you know, and and that's not to say that that you know something like Beneath the Steel Sky or Monkey Island or or Day of the Tentacle you know, don't have their value because they do, they're brilliant games. But they they work very differently. As pixel games, they work very differently. You know, the artwork works differently than, than modern pixel games. You know, so we we were try we were trying not to show the pixels <laughs> even though they were, you know, like you know, huge on screen. We were trying to do things that didn't draw attention to the pixels. Whereas now it's kind of like, oh I'm going to create a pixel game. You know, and 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 part of my mind goes, why, <laughs> why, why not do something good? No, sorry, what what they're doing is good, but you know, why not do something that's more you know detailed and high high definition and and so on? I just I just a bit puzzled by it. I, I'm not saying that what they're doing is bad. I'm just 
I'm confused as to why they would want to. Well, Steve, um, what are you up to these days and what are you working on at the moment? I've been doing um, a mixture of original stuff and script editing. Um, uh, But I've also been trying to write a novel, which is uh, currently with my agent, Mm -hmm. trying to find a publisher. There's possibly some interest. Um, We're just waiting to see. Partly because, you know, sort of like I think that you've got to be able to kind of look at other other media and and work out how they do what they do in order to be able to incorporate that, some of those strengths into game game writing. So so there's a mixture of, of things. I got involved with a game called The Bunker, which is due out in the next month or two, I think. Um, which was actually which is actually filmed live live action. Um, so you kind of get a bit of live action. Then you, you might get a, a kind of like um, quick time event, but you also might get a puzzle. So you know you might get a fuse box that you've got to kind of like work out how to repair or, or stuff like this. So so it's a mixture of things. But the fact that it's it was filmed um, in an actual nuclear bunker down in Essex is. Um, has made it really moody and it's it's fantastic um it's well worth um checking out the trailer that does sound really exciting though because i remember you know you get fmv games back in the early 90s that were all filmed but obviously the technology wasn't there then and i've always kind of thought you know rather than rendering stuff why aren't people filming stuff now that the tech's there so well exactly and particularly with with if you want good acting Mm -hmm. then there's no better acting than a, a live actor even if you get really good motion capture you still you still lose something in translation so why not use real actors and and the brilliant thing is the guy behind it is actually a film maker so he understands all that side but he's also a game player as well so he brought he brought me and a couple of other guys in you know as 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 games people and we kind of thrashed this thing out and worked out you know kind of like the flow of the the, the narrative and what what where to put the puzzles and stuff like this and i think it works really well and i think the fact that you've got someone who's a genuine filmmaker you know working with you know, game developers and game designers, I think is is what, you know, you can, you know, really bring to, to a project like this and give it strength. I just, I mean, it's, not uh, a hu- it's not a huge game, you know. I think it'll only take a couple of hours to play through or something like this. But, um, but, but the quality of it, I think, is superb. I just love the fact you've got a Commodore pet in the trailer. <laughs> As the uh, main <laughs> machine, it's great. Well, this, this bunker was was created in the 50s and then it was upgraded in in the 80s you know sort of like with some some computers and then and then that, all that stuff was just left there so the computers that were sort of like the originals that were just left there oh, wow. but there's also like 1950s telephone equipment and things like this and 1950s geiger counts wow. <laughs> it's just it's just amazing you know it's a fantastic place we, we all went down there and had a you know good look round brilliant you know all the old all the original 1950s beds are there and the and the gray horrible blankets and <laughs> <laughs> definitely so if people um, want if people want to find out more about the game then what where can they go to well there is there is um a website it's actually created by splendy games is it the bunker.com or something like the bunker game.com i think it is something like that that no, looks great yeah, looking forward to playing it. We'll stick the links in our show notes as well if anyone wants to uh, look into it a bit more. We highly recommend it. And uh, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us this week. It's uh, been a real pleasure. Yeah, we've thank really enjoyed reminiscing. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah.